Well, back to our top story now on manufacturing and the call to action on cheap gas, regulation, anti-dumping and IR. We've done a fair bit on IR this year, but to discuss the other issues, I caught up with two of the industry captains, Manufacturing Australia Chair Dick Warburton and Intertech Pivot CEO James Fazzino. Dick Warburton, James Fazzino, welcome to the programme. Pleasure. Well, Dick, we've had a mammoth session this morning, eight captains of industry, but I guess the most interesting policy initiative from, from, from your point of view uh, has been uh, on gas and a call for uh, gas in Australia, some of it to be reserved domestically and at cheaper prices for manufacturing. Well, I'd, I'd like to believe it's not radical. I'd like to believe around for a long time, but this is the first occasion we've had to really present this in a focused fashion to the, the business community, the government community, um, uh, and so that's what was such an issue today. James has got, his, has got much more on that particular issue, so I'll pass it across to him yeah. for some, some of that discussion. Yeah, Tiki, our value proposition is fairly simple. If you take gas and export it as LNG, you increase its value by around three times. If you take that same molecular gas and produce, for example, an explosive emulsion out of it, you increase its value by 20 times. And what our value proposition is, is that Australia can have its cake and eat it too. We can have a wonderful LNG industry. We can have a developing manufacturing industry off the back of cheap gas. And we can actually keep some of that gas in country to produce clean electricity. And if we do that, everyone wins. We, um, the local communities win by the value that we create in manufacturing. And our rule of thumb is uh, four dollars outside the factory gate for every one dollar in the factory gate. The government wins because it gets to tax that 20 times value add rather than three times. And of course uh, the companies win through dividends from those value adding activities. Uh, James, to what extent uh, has your company, Intertech Pivot and indeed other members been impacted by higher energy prices? Well, it's an impact that's coming into the future because LNG prices or gas prices on the east coast of Australia will quickly go to LNG parity around about 2015, 2016. And that has a significant impact on all of manufacturing because the base of manufacturing is competitively priced energy. So it impacts all of our members in manufacturing Australia. Dick Warburton, I can't imagine the gas industry is going to take this lying down, but you met with uh, ministers from the government today. What was their reaction to such a proposal about gas? Yes, we did. We had a, a very good meeting with um, uh, three government ministers this morning, uh, and their reaction was um, almost a case of, gosh, we didn't quite realise this, we didn't quite understand it, and we're very pleased to be able to discuss this with you. So the government was actually open to this? Oh, well, they appear to be open to it. Now, the proof of the pudding will be whether they then take it up and, and implement some of these ideas. And the other thing you were driving, James Fazzino, presumably, was what's going on in the US at the moment. Yeah, that, that's right. And, Tiki, the idea isn't new. President Obama has recognised that the US has the same natural resource endowment as Australia in terms of gas. But the difference is the Obama's administration's policy is to keep that onshore for value-adding. It's, it's forecast that the US will generate 600,000 new jobs in turning that gas into value-added chemicals and other products. That's the opportunity that's available for Australia. Well, let me move to the second of your four pillars, and that's regulation. Uh, Dick, you had Matt Sexton from Rheem deliver some, some startling comments about his business. Well, well it is. He's, he's got the situation where he's got 40 regulatory bodies that he has to deal with. And as he said, that's far more than the number of um, uh, companies in the industry. Um, and these 40 regulatory bodies just take up uh, time, commitment, but also can be contradictory. I mean, he's got some regulations where one state says you need to do this particular function to be able to sell your product, and the other state saying you can't sell it at all because it's quite different. I guess, James, more broadly, uh, I'm looking at all these different regulations, OH&S, um, EOA, Equal Opportunities, Education, the VET, but, but it's actually, if you combine that with industrial relations and, and energy, and it's 
it is the cumulative effect. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And when you look at any of these regulations in isolation, they actually make sense. But it's the cumulative impact of those that actually means that the cost of doing business in Australia is far higher than our competitors offshore. Have you done crunched any numbers about the cumulative impact? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. We, we reduce ammonia and urea um, just under the Gateway Bridge in, in Brisbane. And that's a highly competitive plant. But if we look at what's happened to its energy costs just recently, there's been a new regulation establishing a gas market in Brisbane. That's added another $1.5 million to the cost base of that plant. The carbon tax will initially add 2 to $3 million, increasing every year. And when you just add all of these up, it actually means that it will be very tough to do business in Australia. Uh, Dick, you also talked today about uh, the anti-dumping issue, and I know Phil Job at Capra was particularly passionate about this, this today. What we're asking for is, a, is for a fair marketplace. And as Phil was pointing out, there's actually been quite a lot done recently um, by the government, by unions, working with manufacturing, leading towards a, a better anti-dumping regime, recognising there are 90 anti-dumping countries around the world. But we've struck a roadblock in some of the areas of the bureaucracy and the customs uh, because of the priorities they've got. Uh, we need um, very definitely some direction to customs as to what they can do to unblock those roadblocks. I think one of your, your big concerns was, uh, was China um, and, and, and in particular um, the, the, the acceptance from the Australian point of view of China as a market economy uh, and you've got issues with things like you know, um, uh, credibility of financial accounts and, and um, you know, dumped goods within products and, and all this sort of thing. So it's, so it's actually about training, presumably, customs people, industry working together with government. Exactly, training them, utilising uh, our own experts but also their experts to understand this issue. Finally, one for both of you really. I, uh, I was at a function last night when I was speaking to somebody in manufacturing and uh, they brought up the issue of high tech and their eyes went to the ceiling and they said high tech, high BS. There's a, there's a, there's a feeling out there that, that that's uh, the sort of mantra that you have to talk about when in fact um, it's not all high tech in manufacturing at all. We do, we do other things. Uh, medium tech, uh, mining services, all sorts of things really well. And that's, that's selling manufacturing short. What do you think, Dick? Yes, well, I mean, there's this perception that high tech means you've got to be a Google or an Apple or involved in that sort of area. Um, manufacturing is probably hiding its light under the bushel. We're a commodity-based product. However, having said that, Every one of these companies has uh, an innovation group or an R&D group. Um, Blue Scope, for example, have 40 PhDs working on new techniques, new analysts to, to, to become much more competitive. I'm sure James' yes. company has exactly the same thing. Yeah, Tiki, if I took you into any of our control rooms in the, car, in the company, you'll see actually what we do in manufacturing in, in our business is high tech. Our operators are highly skilled operating plants that have a replacement value of several billion dollars. In terms of the innovation in our business, we produce world-class, world-leading emulsions that have been developed um, in Australia in the Hunter Valley. We have an amazing opportunity in this country to add jobs and create value for our kids by recognising that we have a wonderful endowment in terms of our natural resource base. And as a group in terms of manufacturing Australia and as a government, our task is to go out and grab that and create the type of value that I think we can so that everyone wins. And Tiki, you know, we've always had the low cost manufacturing overseas. That's always been there. The, the high dollar value has hit us pretty hard over the last um, two or three years, but it's something we have to live with. It's the advantages that we have that we've got to take better advantage of collectively with the help of government, with the help of the manufacturers themselves, with the help of unions, with the help of employees. That's where we've got to work on the advantages we've got and do better that way. And we can be successful doing that. I'm quite convinced of that. Dick Warburton, James Fazino, you've given me a lot to explore over the next few weeks. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Thank you, Dickie.